And joining us now to debate the myths and realities of the Canadian healthcare system for the full hour, via webcam in Vancouver, BC, Rick Baker, a healthcare broker who runs Timely Medical Alternatives. In Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Dr. Ann Doig, the new president of the Canadian Medical Association. In New York, New York, Ted Marmer, Professor Emeritus at the Yale School of Management. And here in studio, Dr. Danielle Martin, Chair of Canadian Doctors for Medicare. As I welcome all of you to the program tonight, I'm going to try not to sound typically inferior with that typically inferior can uh, Canadian complex here. Uh, insofar as it is rare that Americans care about anything that's going on up here, but apparently if you watch the health care debate in the United States, uh, they care a lot about our health care system, and that's why we wanted to put tonight's topic on the air to try to understand what's really true, what's not true about our health care system, because we're hearing Americans debating it a lot right now. Let's put some facts on the table about the United States. First of all, there are currently 45.7 million Americans described as having inadequate or no health care insurance. And if you follow the debate in the United States, you know it has gotten very stormy at times. And one of the stormiest moments was actually provided by a Canadian. Take a look. I survived a brain tumor, but if I had relied on my government for health care, I'd be dead. I am a Canadian citizen. And as my brain tumor got worse, my government health care system told me I had to wait six months to see a specialist. In six months, I would have died. Government runs health care in Canada. Care is delayed or denied. Some patients wait a year for vital surgeries, delays that can be deadly. That commercial featuring Shona Holmes from Waterdown, Ontario, has been extremely influential in the debate down south. And Danielle Martin, I'll start with you. How true does her story ring to you? I don't think it rings true to most Canadians in the sense that uh, the vast majority of Canadians who have an urgent need for medical care actually do get it in a timely fashion. Uh, it's true that we actually do face some significant challenges with wait times in Canada for elective uh, procedures and some diagnostics, etc. Uh, but I think if you were to do a survey of the majority of Canadians who've experienced uh, life-threatening brain tumor, you would find that very few of them have had to wait. In fact, the details of Ms. Holmes' case are, are, are hotly debated uh, as to whether or not she needed surgery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but the bottom line, I think, is not really what the facts are. The bottom line is all about perception. And they you know this is an ad campaign that's been launched in the United States by a group who have a particular interest in frightening Americans about any kind of access to public insurance at all. And I think that's really where the critical issue is in this debate. It's not about whether or not this stuff is true, because for most people, I don't think it does ring true at all. It's about what do Americans perceive, and how can we as Canadians help them to understand what the real challenges are that we face in our health care system, and help them to perhaps overcome some of the really significant challenges that they face in theirs. And Doig, how true is the story as far as you're concerned? You know, I, I would agree with uh, most of what Danielle said just then. Um, I think the point she's made is that Canadians are not dying for lack of care in either an emergency situation or in an urgent situation. And as physicians, we're responsible for overseeing that and making sure that our patients don't uh, suffer when their need is urgent or emergent. Um, there are all kinds of facts that may lie behind the experience of any individual patient. And I think Dr. Martin has, has correctly said that um, unless we are privy to all the facts, we can't really know what happened in that given uh, situation. The whole point is that we should not allow ideological debates and mudslinging to deflect our attention from what needs to be done. What needs to be done on both sides of the border is that each of our countries need to look at what's right what's wrong and what's going to work for our respective citizens and stop this um, constant bickering and finger pointing either side of the border. Rick Baker, that ad, your thoughts. Well, uh, Canada Health Act promises us universal coverage, universal meaning everybody. Everybody should be treated equally. Uh, it does not deliver that uh, in a number of areas. First of all, people in rural areas do not get the same health care as people in, in uh, the cities. Elderly people do not get the same level of health care, and I'll expand on that in a minute. Uh, but back to the universal aspect. Um, 
our client Shirley Healy uh, a few years ago, and her her story is is uh, highlighted on our website timesmedical.ca. Her surgeon in Vernon, British Columbia, uh, said, "Shirley, you've got at the most two weeks to live. I cannot give you any." guarantee that I'm going to be able to give you surgery within those two weeks. So surely you need to contact Timely Medical Alternatives. They will get you out of the country, into the state. You will get life-saving surgery down there. I can almost guarantee it. And is that what happened? She contacted us. The next day she was in Bellingham, Washington State. Uh, she had a 99% occluded mesenteric artery. Now the doctors on this panel will tell you that that's an urgent situation. She was starving to death. She lost 40 pounds. Uh, she needed to have this blockage cleared. Uh, she went into a procedure uh, called angioplasty. They stented three arteries. They said, Shirley, when you came to us, you were hanging by a thread. She returned to British Columbia. She went to the government and said, I'd like my money back, please. They said, why would you please give you your money back? Well, I was told by my surgeon, who's arguably an agent of the government, because you paid him, that I was going to die if I didn't leave the country. They said, surely your decision to go outside the jurisdiction was arbitrary and elective. That was an elective surgery. She said, how can it be elective? I was told I was going to die in two weeks. Well, it turns out elective surgeries in Canada are much more than just liposuction and facelift. Uh, an elective surgery is any surgery that does not involve immediate uh, threat to life or limb. So if you've got two weeks to live, that's not an elective surgery. Uh, that is an elective surgery, I'm sorry. That's not considered uh, an emergency. Okay, let me get Ted Marmer into this. and. Um Ted Marmer, I want to read some stats to you first, and then I'll have you comment uh, on, a, on a larger question. Uh, we're calling this graphic, Is There a Doctor in the House? More than 5 million Canadians apparently do not have a family physician, and it's estimated that the current shortfall of family physicians in Canada is at more than 3,000. Um, I, I, I know you're a fan of the Canadian healthcare system. Let's start with that. However, having said that, when you hear the stories that Rick Baker just told us, when you see the ad that is playing in the United States that has had a lot of traction, apparently, with many Americans, uh, does it give you pause about the advisability of exporting what we do here down there? Well, Steve, that was a lot, of, <laughs> a lot built into one question, I must say. <laughs> uh, first of all, on the question of whether you should judge Canadian Medicare by a single story, I think it's just stupid to do so. I mean, I think it's ridiculous to think that whatever the facts are about this particular episode, that they indicate general phenomena without proving that. So my first response is that we're starting off in the wrong foot. You do not start with an anecdote and use it as an explanation of a whole system. That's point number one. Point number two, that particular story has been promoted in the United States in part by a series of actors who are devoted to trying to trash not only Canadian Medicare, but also any of the health care reform that involves government in the United States. One of the actors uh, is the former head of Columbia HCA, who, two of whose officers went to jail for misdeeds uh, in the Medicare program in the south of the border, Richard Scott. And in, it just seems to me, I don't know what word to use. Um, Sad. Stupid was the word you came up with. No, well, I think it's stupid too, but it's sad to be describing Amer either American or Canadian Medicare in the light of a single case. That's, that's the first point I want to make. Okay. The second point I want to make is that I think you exaggerate, it's interesting to me, that, uh, Steve, that you exaggerate the salience of the Canadian case in this episode of American health care reform. Canada was enormously important in the period 89 to 94, uh, during the time when the Clinton plan uh, emerged, and it certainly was salient terrifically when Senator Ed Edward Kennedy was involved in promoting universal health insurance in the 1970s. Frankly, the American discussion of health care reform this year has been strikingly provincial. Hardly any commentary about the facts about Canada or Germany or England, well, few about England, and a few about Switzerland and the Netherlands because of the connection between the choice and competition theme 
that Obama has announced. So I, I, think, I think what you should say is that the reason you and Canada are talking about this case is it was the object of an ad campaign by an interest group in the United States and does not reflect either the virtue of thinking about Canada's benefits and burdens or the virtues of anybody else. So I, from my standpoint, this ad campaign is part of the noise of American public life. It is not Absolutely. an indication of taking Canada seriously, because if it did take it seriously, it would have to obviously uh, compare like with like. And so when you use the question about five million Ameri Canadians without a primary care doctor, did you do the counterpart question in the United States? Which is how many in the United States don't have a doctor? Well, we have a huge, a, a, a massive lack of primary care doctors in the United States. Canada has about twice the number of primary care physicians we do. Per capita. People don't even talk about access to a primary care okay, physician. Okay, well, let me Although, follow up on that. Let me follow up on access, because probably when Bill Clinton was trying to reform health care, I guess when his uh, uh, now Secretary of State wife was in charge of the file, uh, there were a lot of complaints up in this jurisdiction about whether or not people could get timely access to care. And now, in a graphic we're calling How Long is the Wait, wait times in this province have gone down a lot, mostly due to managing resources better. If you need general surgery in the province of Ontario, the Ministry of Health says the wait now on average is 100 days. Cancer surgery, 55 days. Orthopedic surgery, 160 days. An MRI, 100 days. A CAT scan, 42 days. Now, I guess the question people want answered, uh, Daniel Martin, is if a patient has a life-threatening condition, I guess like the example we heard uh, Mr. Baker give out in British Columbia, can you as a doctor get them to the front of the line so they can get more timely care than what was on that list? Absolutely I can and I think Dr. Doig would say the same thing. We're both family physicians working in the system. So you know these weights that are being quoted first of all again are being quoted uh, for truly elective surgeries and their averages, right? Uh, so when, when you look at actually how long it takes a patient to access care in Canada, uh, you, you want to differentiate between those, uh, those conditions that can safely wait and those which cannot. And part of my job as a family doctor and part of the job of any physician who says to a patient you need surgery is to make sure that they get that care within a time uh, that is safe. Who decide, that who is safe for them to do so. What procedure demands quicker access and which can wait? Well, I mean that's part of the art and the science of clinical medicine, right? So, I mean the truth well, is that know. for every for every anecdote that uh, that someone can put forward that says that there's a, a person who was told they had to wait, I can put forward an anecdote about a, you know patients of mine who are find a lump and in, in their breast and are diagnosed and have their surgery within two weeks. So. You know, there, there are uh, most of the time actually the system works quite well and for people who have urgent need, uh, it tends to be there and that actually is the experience that most Canadians have. I think that those stories actually do resonate with the majority of Canadians. I think there was a recent poll uh, conducted this summer that said something like 85% of Canadians uh, were quite satisfied with we the care that they were getting. I'm sure you do. So the, the point is simply that I think that resonates with people's experience. Now that is not to say that we don't have a need for significant improvements. And we should not, uh, frankly, I always say that, that in some ways the United States, having the United States directly south of us exonerates us on some level uh, from a, a need to, to be constantly improving because, frankly, our healthcare system looks so good compared to theirs on so many levels in terms of, in terms of access because you've got 45 million Americans who are actually getting virtually no access at all. Uh, and then you've got uh, significantly worse health outcomes, lower life expectancy, We're, we're going to get to all this. Hang in there. Hang so, in there. You're taking me too far ahead down the line here. I, Steve, I don't want to go there yet. Go ahead, Ted Marmot. could I just make one comment about the access to emergency care illustrated by the case that was cited? And that is, it seems to me, the relevant question should be directed at the doctor rather than at the system. That is, if it were true, that a physician in British Columbia actually thought that there was a life-threatening situation for a patient, the suggestion that they should go first to exit in the system rather than using their influence, as Danielle, I'm sure, would do, that strikes me as an interesting puzzle why that's the case. Huh. And that is that. exactly, if I, if I could, Steve, I'd, I'd like to jump in Dr. at that Dr. Doig and too. then Mr. Baker. Thank you. I, I, I do agree completely. I mean, Danielle has made an important point, which is that 
uh, as an individual physician, it is my responsibility to ensure that if I recognize urgency, it is dealt with in an urgent manner. Similarly, the, the surgeon involved in the case that uh, was so eloquently laid out for us um, had an obligation to ensure that his patient received urgent or emergent care if that was in fact his clinical judgment. And moreover, he had an obligation to contact his provincial health authority for authorization to have the patient receive the treatment out of province if that was necessary. That is the rule in my province and I am quite certain it is the rule in most if not all provinces that if a clinician determines that care is not available within the jurisdiction, there is advance permission for the patient to go out of the jurisdiction and under those circumstances the provincial health authorities will in fact pay a reasonable tab for the patient to have the procedure. Well, let's find out from Rick Baker if that happened here. Did okay, the doctor well, seek that kind of permission and, and take us through the process? You explain what should have happened, and I quite agree. It sounds very, very sensible. I'll tell you what actually happened. Uh, Shirley Healy uh, was scheduled for surgery on a certain date in Kelowna. She traveled from Vernon to Kelowna. And as so often happens in the Florida General Hospital, an announcement came out in the morning saying all elective surgeries, including surgeries, which arguably was not elective, all of them were canceled, just carte blanche, all canceled. Everybody go home. How they come? didn't have any beds. And no the beds. reason they didn't have any beds, they didn't have enough money to hire the nurses to man the bed. So you're quite right. He should have been able to, and he tried his best. He called everyone he could think of. He got nowhere. Finally, faced with the alternative, he said, Shirley, you need to get out of here. Now, Dr. Robert Ellett is the vascular surgeon. It may be that Dr. Martin has greater persuasive skills than he does with the provincial government. I think not. He's been a surgeon all his life. He is so discouraged with health care in Canada that he volunteered on his own nickel to go to Afghanistan to operate on wounded Canadian soldiers, where, by the way, uh, unlike in Canada, where his uh, time is rationed six hours of surgery a week, he was given unlimited hours of surgery a week in Afghanistan. He's one of the great heroes of Canadian health care, uh, in my view. Hmm. Okay. Steve, no matter what is the case about Afghanistan, the details of this particular case are obscure now. We don't really know very much about why it is that this was even categorized as elective. I think we should go to other indicators rather than this particular case. Let's do that right now. Uh, I'd like to talk about how our health care system is financed. And if we can bring this graphic up, Michael, you will see that according to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, uh, the public funds 70 percent of our system, a good chunk of it. And private funding makes up only the other 30 percent of the system. And I guess I would let, there's the pie chart right there. Uh, Dr. Doig, let me get you to start off on this. The last two physicians to precede you at the helm of the Canadian Medical Association were physicians who operated outside the public system, but privately run enterprises alongside our Medicare system make some people in this country uncomfortable. Can you give us some insight into why that is? Well, let's, let's look at what we're talking about, first of all, Steve. Are we talking about private funding for care and indeed on your pie chart I believe that 70-30 split is speaking about private funding. In the Canadian system the things that are paid for privately every single one of your audience can name what they are. They are things like drugs, they are things like physiotherapy, they are things like dental care, all of which is health care but is not primarily physician or hospital care. So first dollar coverage in this country goes to physician care, goes to hospital care. There are other services that are globally part of health care that are privately funded and those are picked up either by the patient paying directly or by third party insurance through um, group insurance or other mechanisms. When we are talking about private in the system that we have, a lot of what is labeled as private is in fact private ownership of clinics. I am myself a private practitioner. I own my own you clinic. You don't see yourself as an I agent of the government? I hire and pay for my earlier? staff. And sorry, I don't did have you hear that, any Dr. source Doig? of funding. I'm the, sorry. I, I did, you, were, you were referred earlier by Rick Baker as an agent of the government. Do you feel that way? 
No. <laughs> Just checking. I, I am not an I'm not an agent of anybody, and anybody who knows me knows that. <laughs> um, the, the The point is that my fees are paid by publicly funded medical procedures. I, I, I am allowed to bill for the, the work I do, I bill the government. Out of that money, I pay my staff salaries, I pay my infrastructure costs. That's different than a purely f publicly funded model in which global funding or some other method is used to provide funding for an institution like a hospital. But most of us in practice, including my predecessor, Dr. Wallet, owns a clinic. In fact, in his case, he owns several radiology clinics. But the procedures that are done there are primarily procedures that are funded by the public system. So what we have is private delivery of publicly funded okay, care. Okay, let me go to Ted Marmer on this. Do you believe that in, do you believe there's a place for privately run clinics and businesses, like Rick Baker's I guess, and I'll let him respond to this in a second, within a publicly funded system? Well, I think Dr. Doig actually was very illuminating. To the extent that a clinic provides services that are not publicly funded, I see no reason to be concerned at all. Uh, to the extent that a clinic or a service like uh, is available to arrange foreign, what you might call medical tourism, that seem, seems to me to be a choice people can make to spend their dollars to go outside the country. Americans have long done that to go to Switzerland when they went for the, you know, for the baths and so on. Um, I think what, what Ann Doig was talking about is absolutely crucial, which is whether or not you can top up the public funding and jump the queue, which is the issue at, at, at stake mm -hmm. in the Chiuli constitutional question. I don't think uh, Mr. Baker's program raises that issue. It may raise the issue of whether or not services are adequately provided in Canada, but it doesn't involve the same queue jumping that the Chiuli case does. And that's why the Canadian ban on private um, supplementation for publicly funded services is such a striking feature of Canadian Medicare. So I think we need to separate these matters and I agree that the word public and private needs to be applied carefully. Canada has a public system for physician and hospital care. It has a mixed system for drugs and a mixed system for lots of other services. The 70-30 split in some ways is misleading. A more relevant dimension would be what proportion of hospital and physician services are represented by Medicare, and that would be in the 90% plus. Right. Uh, Rick Baker, can you tell us why you believe what you do, which is essentially a private business within uh, a country that prides itself on a Medicare system, I think it's fair to say, why that's consistent? Well, uh, I'm in business because there is a demand for our services. Uh, your New York correspondent said it was stupid to concentrate on Shirley Healy. Let me give some other examples. It's and examples all, actually don't illustrate the point. All right, let me give the big picture then. Uh, every year, between 450 and 500 people who are covered by health care in Canada can get their procedures for free, contact us in desperation because although they're promised care for free, they don't get it. 500 people come to us, 400 to 500 people a year, uh, cheerfully pay us for what the government, who's my only competitor, will, will provide them for free, but doesn't actually provide it. They promise it for free, they don't provide it. I do provide it, they come to me, they pay, they get the surgeries they require. We've saved the lives of six people in six years that we've been in business. I know the doctors on your panel have probably saved many more lives than that, but I'm a layperson. I, I don't have any medical training. And I do take some pride and satisfaction in knowing that there's six people in Canada walking down the street who are doing so because they contacted us and we got them care that they would not have got in Canada. It's not just Shirley Healy. Uh, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people over the years that have come to us, and we've helped them out. I'll give one more example. I know examples are infuriating to some people, but here's another well, one. Well, they're not infuriating. They just don't establish the point. <laughs> well, I mean, distinguish between, you just said the five or 600 people. You did not give the population base. So what proportion of the population of the area you're talking about is represented by your clients? Am, That's am a way I to understand? talk about 
that you're saying that it's acceptable if five or six hundred people are left behind, six people over a six-year period should die? Is that the cost of having the greatest health care system in the world as we do in Canada? Is that the price we have to pay for it? Well, I didn't say any of the things you attributed to me. I asked you a question which you didn't answer. Let me give you an which example. Which is the proportion, which is the propor in describing a problem, an essential feature is that you describe the rate at which the problem takes place. And to give an example of a number and not give the comparison of the population from which that number is taken is likely to mislead. No okay. one wants Let's see if we to can have do someone that. dot. Mr. Baker, can you give us, you, you've told us the numbers okay. in your case, what's the population yeah. base upon which that's based? Well, I guess there's 33 million people in Canada, are there not? And there are approximately a million waiting for one medical procedure or another. But oh. your, your man's argument uh, falls flat because <laughs> he says that if, if I'm only helping 500 people, saving them from medical issues, then it's not significant. Could I jump but in here? There are laws against murder in this country. There are not 500 murders every year, and yet. Uh, we don't say, well, there's only 500 murders. That's not significant. Okay. Why do we worry about it? Let me get to Daniel Martin. Got well, hang on a second. Daniel, Daniel Martin's uh, turn. I, I think <laughs> we're allowing ourselves to get deflected way off the point here. I mean, even if it's true that there are five or 600 Canadians out of 33 million who wish to purchase private insurance to exit the country for care, the bottom line is the vast majority of Canadians neither are doing that nor can afford to do that. Okay, let me so give you some we, numbers So when here, we want to talk about the Canadian health care system and its need for improvements, we should be focusing on improvements that everyone can benefit from. Let me get you to speak from. to that. Okay, and that hang means on. Hang on, you've got to stop filibustering that means, here. Hang that on. means improving public health care for everyone. Okay, hang on a sec. I'm going to get you to comment on this then because we want to talk sustainability. One of the things that we keep hearing about all the time is that this system that we're in is not sustainable. Michael, let's do this here. Graphics two and three. Health care spending in the province of Ontario, we're going to start when Mike Harris was Premier, 95, 96, it was 17.6 billion. And for the fiscal year in which we now find ourselves, $42.6 billion we spend annually uh, on the, the Ministry of Health's budget in this province. And if you flip over to the next chart, health care spending as a proportion of our total program spending in government, that pie chart's got a lot of red on it. 43%, we're tw uh, trending up towards half of all program spending is on health care. Only 14% on education, 7% for post-secondary, 13% children's services, 4% for justice, everything else 20. There are, I, I guess one of the features of the debate, Dr. Martin, in the United States has been, all you people who love the Canadian health care system, these numbers show that they've got a system that's not sustainable because the government has too big a, a part of it. Well, there are, so there, are, there are a few things that need to be said about that. The first is that every industrialized country in the world faces this question of increasing health care costs. So whether you're talking about systems which are public or private or mixed or, ha or whatever, um, you know, we're all facing this question about health care costs. But the second and I think more important point to be made is that actually public health care spending in Canada as a proportion of our wealth as a nation has been relatively stable over time. We're actually not spending very much more publicly as a proportion of our wealth than we were 20 years ago. What's changed and what, and what leads to the, the statistics that you're putting forward is that as a proportion of provincial budgets, healthcare is increasing largely because the total size of the pie across the country has been shrinking. Okay, we're spending less on other things and we're, doing, we're making choices about tax cuts, which means that the total amount available is less and healthcare as a proportion of that amount therefore seems to be more. So these are social choices and decisions that we're making as citizens and that the governments that we elect are making. Right. Is it more important to us to, uh, what ends up happening as we all know is a government is elected, they promised to not, not increase taxes or in many cases to cut taxes. They're terrified to touch health care and so they don't cut health care, therefore they cut everything else and what you end up with is health care, as I say, ends up looking like the Pac-Man mm -hmm. of the provincial budget eating okay. up everything in, in front me, of it. Let me get uh, Ted Marmer to speak I may, to these Steve, points. I... Okay, to, for, hang on one second Dr. Doyle because I want to get Ted Marmer sure. to speak to, to these numbers sure. here. Uh, these are numbers we hear a lot as well, that uh, Americans are spending uh, as a percentage of their GDP, you know, 50% more than we are. 15.3% uh, of the United States' GDP is spent on health care, according to the World Health Statistics. We're at about 10.6% here in Canada. 
uh, Americans spend 50% more of their GDP on health care than we do, and yet we live longer, our infant mortality rates are better, uh, we have less poverty. So what are Americans getting for all the extra money per capita they're spending on their health care system? Well, we're not getting better health statistics. You just recited them. So that's not, a, that's not an interesting uh, argument. Uh, I think if you ask what we are getting for the 50% more we spend is we have higher incomes for people in the medical care industry, all the way from insurance executives to malpractice lawyers to nurses, doctors, hospital administrators, and all the rest. The key point about comparing Canada to the United States is not simply that a very lo much larger share of our income goes to medical care, but rather that the difference is largely explained by the prices we pay for the services that we get. We don't get more hospital bed days per thousand. We don't get more office visits per capita. What we get is a bill for the same procedures that is about 40 to 50 percent higher. And that's why so many people in the United States are asking the question, are we getting reasonable value for the high prices we say? The only, the other thing I'd say, Steve, you give me a moment, would be to say this. I think it's misleading to evaluate either the American or the Canadian medical care system by reference to longevity or infant mortality alone. Mm -hmm. Medical care is a much more complicated set of goods and services than it is in life-saving or life-extending. And I think one of the things about the American health care debate that you miss if you take that perspective is the extent to which in Canada, because of its public financing of acute medical care, Canadians don't worry about being bankrupted by being ill or injured. Mm -hmm. Many Americans do, and it's not just the 45.n million who are uninsured at any one time, but a much, much bigger figure of the people who experience a period of non-insurance over any two-year time horizon. And that's in the area of 70 or 80 million Americans. And so if you just calculate that, over any two-year period, a quarter of the American population experiences an episode of non-insurance when their financial security can be devastated. That has nothing to do with longevity, but it has everything to do with economic security. And it's a dimension in which the United States is singularly suffering, and it's what, in part, Obama has been preoccupied with in thinking about extending some insurance to everybody. Okay, so less than 20 minutes to go, still lots to cover. Dr. Doig, you wanted to say. So I, I, I would like to jump in at that point, and that's a beautiful segue into, into what I wanted to say, which is exactly that, that the, the debate is not around in Canada. The debate is not around should we have universal coverage, because I think it is absolutely not on that we would in any way jeopardize the universality in the sense that, that was just referenced with, with the use of the term uninsured or uninsurable. Under we have a guarantee of coverage. What we need to have a public policy debate around is what's, what's meant by the global basket. And what as physicians we need to contribute to is an analysis and a leadership around the quality agenda so that we can make sure that indeed Canadians are getting the best bang for the bucks that they're spending. Um, the examples in the states are appallingly bad. We are not as bad, but we are by no means as good as some of the comparators uh, in other countries in Europe. And I think what we need to do is we need to engage our policy uh, discussion, not around, you know, which is better, Canada or the U.S., because it's, it's a non-starter as an ar argument, but rather around what is it we're paying for and what can we do to improve the quality of what we pay for so that we are spending those dollars wisely and well. Dr. Doig, that is excellent advice, and I'm going to disregard it right now <laughs> because I've got more numbers. Good for you. I've got more numbers comparing this country with other countries, and, uh, and frankly, this is such a huge feature of the American health care debate right now. You know, where should America be looking to its guidance to find uh, its new health care system and health insurance system of the future? Uh, that in some respects, I think we've got to do some of this. Okay, Michael, next chart, please. This from the Atlantic Monthly. From the year 2000 to 2005, per capita health care spending in Canada grew by 33%, in France by 37%, in the United Kingdom by 47%, all comparable, the magazine says, to the 40% growth 
experienced by the U.S. in that same period. So, Rick Baker, I'm going to get you in at this point. If the market is better than governments at allocating scarce resources, then why have health care costs in the United States, which has, of course, a more free market approach to health care than anywhere else, why have the costs increased at roughly the same amount as everywhere else? Well, uh, one of the problems, and uh, Ted, uh, you said something that, uh, from my point of view, is the first thing I've been able to agree with what you've said uh, so far tonight, but you talked about the uh, extraordinary fees and incomes paid to healthcare professionals in the U.S. And one of the reasons that is, is people feel locked into their community. If you live in Cleveland, uh, you go to the Cleveland Clinic because it's right there. They feel free accordingly to raise their prices uh, into the heavens and insurance companies just do to pay it. There's a new concept in the U.S. called medical tourism within the country. And I have a, a sister company, North American Surgery, and I'm working with 22 healthcare providers in 13 states. And we have negotiated extraordinarily low prices for our clients, uh, which are Canadian clients as well, which I think holds promise to be the preferred solution to the healthcare crisis in the U.S. And I'll give you an example. The average and uh, customary price for a joint replacement in the U.S. is $43,500. An insurance company gets a much better deal than that. They pay $24,000. Our clients coming down from Canada pay $18,000. Now, if the average price is $43,500, and yet a clinic and a hospital can make a profit at eighteen, dollars is that not the way the U.S. should be heading? Give you another example. We sent a man yesterday, no, sorry, Friday, for a cardiac artery bypass graft. Do any of your panelists have any conception of what the average <clears throat> cost in the U.S. Is for that procedure is? I think you're going to tell us. Happy to Thank tell you. you. It ranges, ranges from eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, our client paid sixteen thousand in Canada last Friday. That is the future of healthcare, in my opinion. That is how healthcare can be saved in the U.S. And you're quite right, Ted. People at the Mayo Clinic charge way too much. We had a client from uh, Alberta go down to Oklahoma for a an angioplasty. He paid fifteen five prior to going to Oklahoma City. He got a quote from the Mayo Clinic for ninety nine zero thousand. That's ludicrous. That's stupid. Uh, so, yes, they do pay too much now. That is one of the problems with American health care. I think there is an opportunity to cut the, the profit significantly and still allow health care practitioners to make a good living. Okay, let me get some more. Uh, I'm going to incur the wrath of Dr. Doig once again because I'm going to do some more comparing between countries or among countries. Here, according to the World Health Organization, and Dr. Martin, I'll get you to comment on this first, you know, I, I, I know Canadians like to think we've got the best, best health care system in the world. We're very proud of our health care system. Tommy Douglas, we all remember, was the greatest Canadian. But here's the way the WHO rates it. USA, 37th out of 191 countries. Canada, 30th. Great Britain, 18th. France, number one. Dr. Martin, how do they decide what makes one system better than another? Well, it's interesting that you would quote that study, Steve, because there are so many uh, studies that do international comparisons of healthcare systems. And in fact, that study that you've quoted is a study from the year 2000. And the reason why uh, there is no more current data is because it was so widely criticized internationally for its methodology that the WHO said, hold that thought, we're going to go back and revise our methodology, and they haven't even yet put out an, an updated report well, since then. I just want to check that, because the graphic said 2009. And that's, no, that's incorrect. No. It's 2000. It's I can assure you. I can assure Daniel's you. Daniel's correct so about that. Yeah. that okay. I mean, that study has been so widely discredited oh. as, to be, as to be essentially viewed as useless in the policy world. It's still on the WHO website. I, and actually, if you, go to the, if you go to the WHO website, there's a little thing that says, we are now revising our methodology and we'll get back to you when we figure out okay. how to do this well, more accurately. If that's wrong, but the point what's that you're right? Making, the point that you're making is important. Does Canada yeah. have the so-called best health care system in the world? Uh, and the answer is 
Yes and no, in the sense that there are things that we do extremely well in Canada that we should be very proud of. We have a system that ranks very highly in comparison to other nations in terms of equity. We have a system that ranks very highly in comparison to other nations in terms of primary care, notwithstanding the fact there are some people who can't get a family doctor. We have a system that does very well in terms of um, on some uh, types of cancer care and cardiac care, and there are other indices where we do very well. There are other areas where we do very poorly. And so, uh, you know, I'm not here to say that the Canadian healthcare system is perfect, and I don't think that any, any no of us would. No doctor does. Exactly. Right. We, we, all, we all see that there's vast room for improvement. Let me get Ted Marmer on this, though. Uh, you know, in Canada, I think there's wide consensus on the notion that we have a single-tier system that nobody should, by virtue of uh, their wealth, be able to buy their way to the front of the line. But I think that notion uh, is not the same in the United States. Can you tell me why there appears to be more appetite in the United States for the notion of allowing people to buy themselves better health care? Well, that's a wonderful question, Steve. I also don't think that when Canada's Medicare program was enacted, Canadians were agreed upon uh, that the egalitarian value that it expressed was 100% was shared. I think over time, during the time that I've studied Canada, the, the equitable feature of Canada has become a value much more than was the dominant value at the very outset. And in the United States, had we enacted universal health insurance in 1971 when Teddy Kennedy proposed something close to the Canadian system, I think Americans at that time would have had a similar, more egalitarian uh, disposition. But for the last 40-some years, we have heard an endless re report and amplification, both in the United States and Canada, that the market does things better. And the, the, the case to be made for treating medical care as a special kind of service that's not to be allocated by ordinary market criteria, that view of a merit good has fewer advocates in the United States now than it did 40 years ago. But I would say oh, I'm absolutely certain that more than a majority of Americans, when asked that question, should medical care be allocated the way cars are, or should it be allocated the way we're supposed to allocate access to primary school education? they would take the latter overwhelming of overwhelming well, majority. I've, I've so got I, some numbers I, on that. Let me let me see what I can do on this. Uh, Michael, okay. if you will, board 7. Here according to Angus Reid. I can't Reed, see that, Steve. No, I'm going to read it to you. It's okay. According to Angus Reid, uh, the polling agency, uh, they conducted this poll in July, and Dr. Doig, I'll get you to comment on this. 31% of Americans have a positive view of their healthcare system. 31%. In Canada that number is 65%. You'll remember that commercial we showed off the top of the program tonight, the one where the woman from Waterdown, Ontario said she nearly died because of this health care system? 68% yep. of the Americans who saw that ad described it as informative, and 44% thought that it was honest. That's surveyed of Americans. Canadians, 58% thought that ad was deceiving, and 46% thought the ad was unfair. And Dr. Ann Doig, when you see those numbers, what do you infer from them? I, inf I infer exactly what was said in the earlier comment, that an anecdote is not evidence. Um, for people who have had intersections with the healthcare system, individually they may have had a problem, but collectively they are not aware of the big picture. And so when a Canadian person says, yes, we have good health care, and yes, it's, it's wonderful here in Canada, um, there is a little bit of collective, of collective speak there that's happening, even though individually a person might have had something happen that was less than ideal. What we need to look at is what is the collective wisdom in Canada around what we want. I mean, we just heard that people's ideas about equity, people's ideas about egalitarianism, people's ideas change over time. And what a system was built to look like in the early 1960s or when it became the Canada Health Act in 1968, what it was made to look like 40 years ago is not necessarily what Canadians would do if they could design it fresh today. So the public policy debate has to be around what does our much valued and highly vaunted public system offer 
that is good and needs to be kept and what about it needs to be changed to make it better because it can do better. There are anecdotes, there are people who have had difficulties. Those people's voices need to be heard but they don't need to be translated into evidence that one person's experience makes a story. So Rick Baker, tell me this, why has in the American debate that's been ongoing now depending on when you want to start the clock, either since 1994 with the Clinton experiment or 1971 with Teddy Kennedy or under President Obama just latterly. Why do so many Americans seem to regard the Canadian health care system as a kind of a bogeyman? Even the president in his speech last week said, we're not going to bring in the Canadian health care system here as much as some people on the left of the Democratic Party might want it. Why does the Canadian system have that role in the United States? I think it's because in... Uh in the U.S., the personal welfare uh, individuals reign supreme. In Canada, uh, we've just heard, we have a collective uh, system. The collective wisdom is that on average, people should get good care and the anecdotes don't count. In the U.S., the anecdotes do count. Uh, individuals reign supreme down there. You know, collective society has worked very well in the insect world, the uh, anthills and beehives. But for God's sake, we're not bumblebees. We are a nation of individuals who have been promised universal coverage and we are simply not getting it. Mr. Baker, you know, you can't see the rest of the people who are on the program with you, but uh, Ted Marmer's got the most curious look on his face when you made that analogy and Ann Doig uh, and uh, Danielle Martin are kind of grinning. <laughs> so. Um, why are you grinning so much here, Dr. Martin? I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's frankly a little bit absurd to suggest that we have a system here that, um, that doesn't value individuals in, in, the, in the Canadian health care system. The, again, the, yes, Dr. it's Martin, true that... Let me ask you a question, if I can break it. Let's sure, go imagine ahead. that you were the family physician for a client of ours uh, last month living in eastern Ontario who had been waiting over two years for a consultation with a gynecologist, over two years. She had a prolapsed uterus. She was in significant discomfort. She couldn't even get a consultation. Now, the consultation wouldn't have repaired her prolapsed uterus. The gynecologist just would have examined her and said, well, you certainly do appear to have a prolapsed uterus. We'll mark you down for surgery sometime in the next year or so. You know, uh, I actually, I don't have to, I don't actually have to imagine a case like that because I see, uh, I see cases all the time of mm -hmm. patients who uh, have particular medical problems that need specialist attention. And part of my job as a family physician is to help figure out who needs a consultation <clears throat> and on what kind of urgency basis. And I should add that I don't just work in urban Toronto. I also work in rural communities where access to specialists is extremely sparse and, and needs to be utilized. Uh, those resources need to be managed very carefully. Um, and, well, without getting into the, and without getting into the specifics of what mm -hmm. I would do for someone with a prolapsed uterus because this isn't a medical show, um, I can assure you that when I see patients who I believe have urgent need, I do what every family doctor in this country would do, which is I pick up the phone and I call the specialist. And every specialist that I have ever called ever about a patient who had a, a, a seriously urgent or emergent medical problem has responded right away. Let's get Rick Baker's response. Uh, well, her uh, family doctor did the same thing. Now, we've already determined you must be far more persuasive than doctors like Dr. Robert Ellis, the vascular surgeon in Paloma. Maybe you're more persuasive with getting a gynecologist. In any case, this woman, after two years of waiting, contacted us. She went down to Oklahoma City. She had a procedure using a device called a Da Vinci robotic uh, procedure. There are three Da Vinci robots in Canada. Oddly enough, two of them are in London, Ontario. Go figure. I, I don't understand why they would have two thirds of the but, country. Okay, but most of my patients actually can't afford to travel to the United States to have a robot perform surgery on them. So why don't we talk That's about what sad. improvements can be made to the public system in Canada to ensure okay. that every Canadian has access let, uh, within let, a reasonable time frame to high quality health care. You, you all have to forgive me because we're literally down to a minute and a half and, and uh, Ted Marmer, I want you to take a minute of that. 
uh, to answer this question. One of the things I think Canadians have found curious in the whole American debate right now is Medicare is a government program. Medicaid is a government program. The VA, the Veterans Administration, is a government-run program in the United States for health care. They're popular. They seem to, I mean, obviously with exceptions, they seem to work reasonably well. And yet this whole notion of get the government out of my health care system persists in the United States despite the fact that the government is in your health care system in a major way down there. Why is that? Oh, Steve, goodness gracious. And you get a minute you're, to answer that. Well, you're, you're repeating what can only be described as lies, distortions, and myths. I mean, a lot of the public, unfortunately, is in the grips of illusion. So when that person in, in a town hall said, keep your hands off my Medicare, get the government out of my Medicare, the answer should have been, by President Obama, this poor citizen is in a state of complete mental collapse <laughs> and needs immediate treatment. I mean, the problem in our debate, this time as the last time, is, is that it represents more a triumph of illusion than it does of truth. And so the Canadians who are watching your program should feel smug that a very substantial proportion of the American public operates on the myth that Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA are not government programs. This is really quite crazy. Um, and so what I would say is it's, it is about 30% of the American public live in a zone in which the word government counts as a negative uh, term. I suspect a fair number of people in Alberta share this view, frankly. I've got to jump um, in here, Ted Marmer, because we're literally out of time, and I need enough time to be able to say thank you to Rick Baker from Timely Medical Alternatives in Vancouver for putting up with our online camera system there. We're grateful. Dr. Ann Doig, we congratulate you on being the new head of the CMA. Thanks for being there from Saskatoon. Thank uh, you. I want to do Danielle Martin next, because Danielle Martin is... Uh, it looks like seconds away from having a baby, so we <laughs> congratulate you and we wish you well. And Ted Marmer, if the others will indulge me for a second here, the very first program I ever did on this television station back in 1992, you were a guest. You came up from the United States to McMaster University, and I'm so glad that you and I are still kicking around to talk about health care again tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Now, for more information about tonight's guests and an interactive map on global health care costs and more information on Canadian and American health care spending, please visit us online at tvo.org slash the agenda. Tonight's program is produced by Sandra Jonas, and you can read Sandra's post called The Paranoid Style in Healthcare Politics. You'll find that on our Inside Agenda Producers blog, also online at tvo.org slash the agenda.